Test, test. Test, test, test one, two, test one, two. Uh, let me see. What up, y'all? Warrior Wednesdays. Where my movers at? Am I live? Where my movers? Yo, my man Reg Hunt. What up, Reg? What's the word, kid? Hold on, my other line. Yo, Jay, I just got on my live. I just started my live. So I'm actually live right now on Instagram. Can okay, I call you right after? Will do. Thank you. Shout to my, that was my man Josh Takeman just now, guys. Incredible. It, it's Josh Takeman, founder of eBoost. If you're not following him, you need to go and follow my man Josh at eBoost. Incredible guy. We did an incredible seminar today, incredible panel today. So I'm looking forward to talking about that. Shout to my man Reg Hunt. Reg, what up? Joe Paul, I see you, kid. What up? What up? Derek Ferguson in the building, Vibranian Gold. I love it. I love it, y'all. I love it. Christian, what up? I'm feeling pumped. We had a great, great, great day today. Got through with our first uh, power panel, but I'll talk about that a little later. Wait and let everybody get on. So, Soji, what up, kid? It was that Jay Frey. I see you. Ashley, in the building. Yeah, people coming to learn. Warrior Wednesdays. I hope y'all come with questions. I hope y'all came to learn tonight. Please do me a favor, guys. Go tag somebody before we get started. We get started in about another three minutes. Get into it. Uh, but tag somebody and let them know we are live. If they're interested in learning uh, about starting a business, growing a business, about going to the next level in their career, this is where they need to be. Shout to all my movers. Movers, what up? I'm in a good place right now, guys. Who else we got here? Call call B Luxury. I hope I got that right. Or is that Carrie B? I think. Not sure, but shout to you. Um, if you guys have not checked it out, incredible, incredible interview with senior VP AR over at um Warner Brothers this week. My man Ray Daniels, he dropped so many gems. If you are, and you know, you would think that we would have a music conversation, but we had an incredible life conversation. So shout to my man, um, Ray Daniels. He, I mean, he killed it. He upped the ante for anybody who is coming on next with these interviews. But this is why I love my Power Move Maker community. I love the movers because... You might think we're going in one direction, but the conversation takes these incredible turns. And I'm learning every time I sit and I speak to somebody, every time I interview somebody. So please check out that uh, conversation with my man, Ray Daniels. Who else we got? Uh, JTW, what up? Movers, movers, movers. Please tag somebody. Black Wealth Renaissance in the building. Those is my little brothers right there. Shout out to my little brothers, Black Wealth Renaissance. If y'all ain't following them and y'all like what we doing on this side, please. They are they are they're right in line with with our mission statement. They are giving back. They are trying to educate, motivate, and inspire. They are sharing so much knowledge and doing so many great things. So please go follow. Black Wealth Renaissance. I love those little guys. Uh, I'll start in one minute and we'll get it moving. Um, what do we have? What do we have going on? I want to talk to you guys. Matter of fact, I'll just get into it now. Um, if if there's anything that you guys want to discuss tonight, um, let me know in the comments real quick. But we are definitely going to bring my man Derek Ferguson into the forefront shortly. Um, and he and I will go over a few things that we definitely think you guys can benefit from. But today we had our first um, power panel. So it's an amazing panel that we created. 
Uh, it's open up to anyone, but we are really trying to focus on college students in the next generation of leaders. So if you know anybody who's in college, they should be signed up for the next power panel. Today we had students from over 20 campuses, um, colleges and universities across the country. Uh, it was a deep dive conversation on entrepreneurship. You guys, I hope you were in attendance for it. And if not, make sure you guys are in attendance for the next one. We are doing this power panel once a month, every single month. And it's really to educate and, and inspire and motivate, like I always say, the next generation of future leaders. Um, today, I got to shout out my man, Josh Takeman. I got to shout out my girl, Dia Sims. Josh Takeman is the CEO and founder of eBoost. Um, you know, that is a, a, what is it? It was the first non-GMO energy product on the market. And Dia Sims, she is the uh, CEO of, of Lobos 1707. That is a tequila. She is partners with LeBron James. So th this is definitely something you guys, I, you, you missed a goodie today. Tommy Heads, what up? I see you. Um, and we also have people in, from London. Now, uh, and, and definitely shout to my man, Tommy Heads. Tom, you know, we need to talk offline. I want to finish that conversation we were having um, earlier this week. So, you know, one of the things that we want to talk about today is, is determining the size of the market um, of your potential business. And this is one of the things that I feel like so many entrepreneurs fall short on is, you know, you, you, you have this incredible idea. That's great. You think people will buy into it, but truth of the matter is how do you go about determining how big is the market? Like, you know, what if you decided to, I don't know, do, do a product that, that only, you know, is focused on people who are left-handed. Is that a huge market? Is it a small market? How do you determine how big the market is? You know, over the past, I don't know, 20, 15, 20 years, I am not necessarily an animal person. I had no idea how big the pet market was. But over the last few years, you have seen companies like Irons and, and Blue and so many, and, and you know, Chewy.com who have come in and they've created these multi-million and billion dollar businesses that that are are scaling to the next level and somebody like me who is not a necessarily a pet person i would have never thought the market would would have been that big for dogs or cats or for anything like that so i want to take a second and and talk to you guys today because it's one thing to come up with a great idea that's step one but you have to determine is there a marketplace is, is there anybody out there that will buy your goods? Is there anybody out there that will buy into your services? So if you don't mind, I see my man, Joe Jackson. Joe, what up, family? If you don't mind, guys, do me a favor. Type in the comments now because I want to I bring Derek into the conversation, but I want to I actually use a real life example. Tell me what business you're into. Joe Jackson, I know you are a promoter. You're an event coordinator, event planner rather. So please take a second and just um and just tell me what what industry are you in? What 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 business are you either trying to get off the ground, you have off the ground, and we will walk you through exactly how to determine how large the marketplace is for that business. Uh, so what do we have here? And I see my man Flash in here. Flash the executive. What up? Okay, we see Miss June Jones. Music business. Okay, that's common. Low-hanging fruit. Who else? Who else is in the building thinking about starting a business or getting a business off the ground and would like to know how big that marketplace is? An entertainment exec. Big time CEO, entertainment executive, got you. A big time, what up family? Been a long time too, how are you? Anybody else? Anybody outside of, okay, here's a good one, a health spa. And I wish I could pronounce, what is that? Um, Samora, Samora Harrison, 
I think I got that right. Hellspog, give me another one before I bring Derek into, into the fold. Give me somebody else who is not in music. I got music, entertainment exec, uh, health spa, artist management, podcasting, great, financial consulting. Okay, we got a lot of good ones. Whatever, DJ, whatever, what up, family? Uh, Soji, athletic apparel, great. And, and I see you, Simone. I got it right. I got you. Uh, okay. I'm going to bring my man Derek Ferguson into the fold. I think we have a lot of great industries here. Blade, what up? Blade the Great, I see you. I'm not sure if I did that right. Bear with me, guys. Okay. Derek. Chris, okay. can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm, I'm turning the wrong way, right? Hold on. Let me turn myself. Oops. No, nope, that's not right. I'll turn it right. I'll turn it. Man, I tried to get myself set up, and I set it up. <laughs> turned the wrong way. All right. Dean Berg. Okay, so, Derek, before you start, because I keep telling people I'm bringing Derek Ferguson in, into the fold. Derek Ferguson is a... Uh, 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 find it in the, for anybody, I know you guys are used to him. He's, he, he's a regular here, um, on Power Move Makers. He has been so kind, uh, in, in, in really just extending his knowledge, his wisdom, his experience week over week with this community. Derek Ferguson is a mover, a master entrepreneur, business executive. So please, for anybody who is new to the community, Listen up, because every week Derek drops incredible jewels. So, Derek, again, welcome. I know for many of the, the the regulars, they don't need an introduction to you, but just in case somebody's in the live tonight who who this is their first time coming in contact, I want them to understand you are a mover to to the fifteenth level. Great, thank you, Prez. And yeah, this is uh so the topic we you know tonight you know we have a lot of good. Uh, is brought up in the last couple of sessions and every you know we kept getting the question around well how do i do my projection how do i know how big my business can be and i thought it would make sense to spend some time on that uh, because it's really critical so why is it critical to know this one is first thing is to figure out is the business worthwhile like as i said if i have a very specific set and, you know, and, and uh, I'm thinking about starting a business and I want to attract customers and, uh, you know, I basically uh, can, can quickly size up that, you know, that may be a very small marketplace and or it may be small and very crowded with competitors. So I don't have a real opportunity to build a big business. Uh, the, the, other, the flip side could be you could be trying to enter a huge business, a business that is in size, and there are a lot of competitors that are big companies that you didn't have to figure out how are you going to, going to uh, compete with them. And just so you know, you know, um, my I spent 19 years at Combs Enterprises working for Sean Combs, and you know he got to a certain point where he was just like, I don't want to enter any business where I can't build it to a billion dollar valuation. So before we even jumped into the business, we had to size it up to say, not only how big is the market, but how big market do we think we can realistically gain in order to jump in that business? So, you know, it's an important, it's a, it's an important step uh, before you enter business, but also in businesses you're in, knowing this information and sizing it up can, can help you really figure out you know, where you can go with the business and, and what you can expect. Great. Okay, so Derek, you know, let's, and I, and I know you came up with an example, but let, you know, we had some some people who wrote in the comments and they said the different um, business, the different industries that they're in. I just want to choose one and maybe you can use that as an example um, on how people can determine how big the marketplace is. And, you know, interestingly enough, I, 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 I love that this is the topic for tonight, right? Because 
yes, it's great to be your own boss, but you know, you have to really, before going into business, kind of have an idea on what your long-term aspirations are. If it's just to be a sole proprietor and be able to put food on the table, great. Maybe, you know, going into a, a industry that's very small might meet the needs of some people. But like you said, um, Sean Combs, I, what I didn't realize is he kind of gave the directive that he didn't even want to go into any industries that are um, you know, could not scale to a business, a billion dollar business. So that's even, even great to know. So go ahead. I, I don't know if you can see some of the um, yeah. different industries. Uh, I like, I like the spot. That could be a good one to take. And I may not, I may, we may not have, have all the answers here, but we'll, we'll give you the process. Uh, and I don't know if the uh, young lady that, that asked for that one is still on, but yeah. So, uh, you know, let's just take a, a spa. And, you know, the first thing you got to do is, and by the way, Prez, am I getting a lot of feedback? Can you yeah, it's going in and out a little bit. It's not necessarily feedback, but it's going in and out. Let me turn down my volume. Maybe that's a little better. How's that? Let's see. I'll let you know. All right, great. So, um, so let's take the spa. The first thing is to really uh, focus on what, you know, what is the business, right? So when you say a spa, and I and because we can't talk back and forth, let's just assume, you know, let's assume what it is. But I think if you're thinking about it and you haven't figured out, like, well, what what's going to happen at this spa? Is it going to be massages? Is it going to be facials? Is it going to be nails? Uh, let's just assume we're talking about uh, massages, facials, classic kind of spa, Um and, uh, you know, you have to, you want to start out by first thinking about what is the addressable market, right? So the addressable market could be um, if you want to start with thinking about I'm in the United States, right? And in the United States, I want to understand uh, how much people spend on massages, right? So, you know, you start out, your research is critical. And a lot of this research you can do, you know, we call it desk re research with the, uh, with the internet and with, uh, you know, good, good navigation around the internet and, and uh, news and so on, you can really get a lot of information, right? The census has a lot of information. Uh, industry reports, unbelievable how many industry reports you can get uh, for free. Um, the other thing is analyst reports for public companies are a good source of information uh, and just information that public companies put out. So public companies or any company listed on the stock exchange, they have to provide information about their business. And oftentimes you'll find good data there. But, you know, so at a, start, a starting level, we say there's an addressable market saying, you know, you know, if I start out by thinking that in the United States, you know, there's some, mar there's some market, total market size of how much people are spending on, uh, on, on spas, right? So let's just, I'm, you know, you're going to do your research, you're going to look it up, you're going to figure it out, but I'm going to give you a rough, we'll give you a little rough uh, number that I'm just kind of coming up with. But if you, if you say, you know, we, we, we have about 100 million households in the United States, and let's say on average, each household spends thirty dollars on massages. Just just making up numbers now, but you can get this actual information again. Your desk research, and then when we get when we when we go from addressable market to available market, we're going to get a little more specific. This is just kind of the universe of the market, right? So again, thirty dollars per household estimate, one hundred million households. So that's three billion dollars. So that, that would say that the full market in the United States is $3 billion for these health, health spa services. So now you then have to say to yourself, okay, that's a potential market, but like I really realistically, I'm only going to operate in New York City, right? So uh, that's what, when we, when we go from that addressable market where, 
you realistically are going to open your businesses, that then becomes the available market. So again, sticking with New York City, we would then say, I need to take that three billion and say, well, what, what is my market in New York City? And again, desk research. Now you can also hear as you're narrowing down to where your business is going to be, you can also think about surveys and gathering your own primary information. But I still would say that desk research, the research on the internet, going to the various reports, uh, if you, if you, a good investment, uh, and I know a lot of times this is not the thing people want to invest in, but a statistic, a, a statistica, uh, I think I'm saying it right, dot com is a great source of just every piece of information you can imagine. There is a monthly subscription uh, s subscription price to it. Uh, I think I'm actually saying it wrong. Stat Statista. That's it. Statista. S T A T I S T A. And you can we could go on there right now and look for market size of health spas, and you know you'll come back with a bunch of information. Uh, some of it's free but some of you have to pay for, and you can also get a monthly subscription. But now come back, coming back to New York. So now I'm in New York. So now I'm narrowing down my 3 billion into, into, New, into New York City. Uh, we do the desk research, we gather information. Let's say now we say, you know, let's say we find that New York City is essentially 5% of, of, the, full, of the full market, right? So at 3 billion, 5% of 3 billion is 150 million. So the New York market size, New York City, for spas is 150 million. So that is what is theoretically available to you. So you're playing in a space with 150 million dollars. So that's that's a great starting point. Uh, so the next thing then you want to take a look at is to understand the competitive landscape. So there's 150 million dollars to chop up. Uh, and now the question is, who's in there satisfying that, uh, that, that market or serving that market? Um, so, uh, you know, so there, again, is one, you, the first thing you do is visual research, right? So if you're going to start a business anywhere, you know, you need to know the landscape. So it's just like, I'm driving around Manhattan. I'm driving around Brooklyn. What are the names all the spas I can find. Oh, okay. I'm seeing that there's a chain here. I'm finding 10 of these, 20 of these, 30, 30 of these. So let's call it XYZ spa. You find that you just do your visual inspection. You see 25, 30, 40 of them, right? So now you're like, okay, I got to really dive in and figure out what this spa is doing and understand their strategy, all of their locations, what their numbers are. Uh, so that's that, you know, that so that's a type of information you'll get just by doing your standard visual research and figuring out competitors. And, you know, even things like, you know, going to your Google Maps and putting in spy and looking at, well, how many are in Brooklyn? How many are in New York? How many are in the Bronx? And looking for things like, are there chains? Are there franchises? All of these things you can dis discover by doing that basic research. So, um, you know, so that once you lay out the competitive landscape, you can figure out how you can fit in, potentially. So now you start thinking about it. And you're like, okay, it's 150 million dollars. Let's say we're going to make it. It's you know, I would assume there's probably a lot of spa players, but let's say there's three big ones and a hundred small ones. We just make it up. But the three big ones, you know, they make up two thirds of the market. So if the three big ones do close to 100 100 million dollars in sales and the remaining 100 split the 50 million in sales, right? So now if you, now you start seeing where, if you're thinking about one individual spa, where do you fit in? So you fit into that 100 spas that are really splitting $50 million, $50 million right now. Um, so, you know, that, that, again, on average, that means they're doing um, 500,000 uh dollars per location um if i did that math right yes that the math is right uh so <laughs> uh so so 
So so now you got a sense of where those smaller players are and you got these three bigger players. So so now what you want to start thinking about is your specific proposition and the demographic you want to serve. So you may say, yeah, I want to be in the spa business, but I think my real differentiator is I'm going to be able to address the Hispanic market better than anyone else, right? So I'm going to really define my customer a little bit more finely. And I want to say I'm going to serve primarily uh, 21 to 55-year-old Hispanic women uh, who are first-time spa goers. Well, however you think about your customer, now you're going to narrow it down a little bit more, right? So you, you know the landscape. You know who's out there. And now you're like, okay, if I'm just competing broadly, I, you know, I, don't, I don't feel like my proposition is going to compete broadly. I want to narrow in and focus on this, you know, 21 to 45 year old Hispanic woman, first time spa goer. So when you, the reason why you want to chop that up is it allows you to start thinking about your competitive advantage, right? And if you just st stuck with, okay, I got to compete with these hundred plus players and the three big ones on that, I want to do exactly what they do you know, you're going to have a whole lot of issues competing with that. Uh, you're going to have, first off, you have three mega players that are going to have more scale than you. Probably all their costs are going to be lower than you. They're going to have more marketing dollars. You you know, you really, you know, you it's really going to be tough to compete against. But again, by narrowing your focus and creating a specialty in there, you now have another approach to to really driving a differentiator uh, for your for your business. Now, one, let's say you decide that. Um, what you then would want to go back is go back to your data and say, now I know what people are spending nationwide for spa services. Now I need to go specifically find out uh, what this you know Hispanic female market is spending and that may even be something where you want to do your own survey um survey some some survey people online whatever it may be maybe there's information you can find but getting that specific information could be really critical for you now thinking about what your next step is and you may you may the other things you you'll find out when you get that information you may find out some other things about your locations so you may say hey this is going to really work the best because demographically I have a bigger cluster of my target. This may work the best in the Bronx. So I need to really focus on the Bronx. Right. Um, so all of that has come through this process of understanding the landscape and then figuring out what your, what your specialty, what your specialty is. Um, so really now we framed an analysis of your market, right? So now just elevate a pitch. If I run into you in an elevator, I'm like, uh, you know, Miss XY, what I, I don't know if we know her name. Like, tell me about the business you want to start. Well, you know, I'm in the spa, health spa services. I know the nationwide market is $3 billion. I know New York is, uh, you know, $150 million. Uh, but I'm focusing specifically on female Hispanics, first time bar goers, that that the size of that market is, you know, whatever, 10 million. And I can't find any other plays in the market doing what I'm doing. So I have this clear lane. I, I'm thinking about opening two locations in the Bronx, two in Brooklyn, whatever it may be. But now you've taken a knowledge of the frame of what this whole marketplace looks like, and you can tell your story much more clearly. And I'll just pause there to see if that makes sense or if there are any other questions. or Guys, if there's any other questions, type them in now. Yeah, Derek, I was, I was sitting here and I'm following every word you said, and I'm, I love the way that you brought it back home. Um, because when you, when you were like, you should uh, go more targeted, even more, I was like, well, isn't that shrinking? The, you, you, you know, this your, your piece of the pie, essentially, like, shouldn't you be going broader? But it started to make sense, as you were saying, you know, now you can speak specifically. I do this, and this is what I specialize in. And I started to even think about my company. 
um, you know, especially and you and you know, it, you know, back in the days, traditional marketing was all array, right? Meaning, radio, uh, radio advertising, buying radio spots, uh, billboards, uh, print. In those days, there were magazines. We came along and we were totally out of the box thinkers. We were on the ground, grassroots and alternative marketing, basically street teams, anything that was on the ground. So for us, we were able to narrow, and I never thought about it in this way, but it, it's really the same um, psychology and the same breakdown. And even more so, as you were talking, I was like, oh, I got it even more because our sales pitch was, we get that, uh, you know, the ad agencies on Fifth Avenue, they, they understand advertising, but what they cannot do is get into the crux of our communities and service these consumers where they live, where they work, where they play. And that was our competitive advantage. And when I discovered that, that was my sales pitch going into any of these um, boardrooms and talking to these marketing execs like, look, we understand you guys can go and buy a radio uh, spot. You guys can go and put up a billboard. But what you can't do is get into the local barbershops, the local salons. You cannot um, get into the hood in the way that we can and come with the authenticity that we can come with. So great the way you broke that down. I think there's some people who are um, – Asking some questions there, if you want to tackle. Let me say one thing on that, Fred. I uh, I use that as an example now, and the main point was, if you didn't go that route, and you said, "Look, I'm going to compete in this market broadly," you know what you're up against. So you you know that goes back to you know just a conversation about competitive advantage, because ultimately, you now now you know what you're up against. So can you compete against three large players? and another 100 players in the marketplace, can you compete? And if it's a broad approach, just know what you're up against and know that you need to have a strategy that's going to win versus that broader market. And the second thing I just want to say as it relates to your business, Fred, you know, even today, however many years later, I still would say to anybody that you're the, you're the master of understanding, you know, grassroots street marketing and even – you, you know, you know this, that even though at Robin Hood, we were trying to reach people in communities, I was like, I know the specialists. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. You know, it's amazing how if you carve something out for yourself, it stays with you really forever. Yep. Uh, I don't know if there's some questions there. Maybe you can see on your side. Guys, if you have any questions um, regarding carving out or understanding how large your market space is, please put them in the comments now and we will try to answer as best we can. Or if you have any just overall business questions. Let me see. I see comments, I don't see questions. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I at a certain point the comments stop for me, Prez. But I don't know. Maybe I'm not seeing seeing everything. But uh, one other thing I just emphasize: it, if you if you are frugal like me, it's amazing what you can find for free if you just go that next level of searching and you know dig around. Sometimes you can find the market size of an industry in an article. It'll be referenced in an article and a report will be referenced in an article. If you're talking about music, you know, the free report that's amazing, you can get it free right now, is the RIAA report. It comes out every year, it gives you a breakdown of total music sales, uh, United States broken down by genre, broken down by format, whether it's stream versus uh, downloaded versus if there's still CDs and vinyl. So yeah, there there are sort you know there are a lot of sources. Apparel, I saw some things here on apparel. Um, there are, there are sources that will you know that 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 will uh, uh, reports that are again accessible for free that will give you apparel sales trends. Oh, one thing I missed. The other thing I missed. I'm sorry to talk about 
was even once you get the size of the market, the next thing you have to also then look at is what the growth of that market is. Very important, and I'm sorry I missed it. Uh, the growth of that market, because if you look at the prior couple of years and the market is size is staying about the same, that's just a that's just a red flag. Because you're like, what's going on? Why is it this growing? Um, versus if you if you're looking at a, a industry or a market and you see growth is incredible, uh, you know that there's some real opportunities there. Uh, so really important not only to to understand what the market size is today, but to have some sense of what the trend is. Again, desk research can get you there. Uh, if, you, if you, you know, most companies when they talk about their future growth, talk about the um, industry growth projections. Uh, so a lot of good information you can you can find on that. But very important in your market analysis is to also look at. Uh, potential, uh, what the projected market growth is. Hey, Derek, uh, somebody wrote, uh, this is JTW says, I know a company that put locations near Starbucks because they were targeting a similar de demographic, knowing that Starbucks did extensive research. They just piggybacked off their locations. Um, would you recommend that approach? And that's actually very, very smart. Yeah, I mean, you do have companies, McDonald's, companies that do an extensive, you know, amount of research, uh, location research. So uh, there have been strategies like that. I mean, what's, what sometimes uh, is odd to see uh, is you sometimes you wonder, well, you know, if there's a Best Buy right there, why is there a Circuit City right next to it? It's because that market is such a good market that they both have identified it as a key market and they're not scared to compete against each other because obviously they think, you know, uh, they, they can win that competition or the market is just that big. So a lot of times, you know, you may think offhand, you know, to be where they, they aren't is the best strategy. Not always the case, right? So, you know, again, if you think about uh, 125th Street in Harlem, um, you know, if you're saying, I got a great restaurant idea, you know, and, and you look up and down 125th Street, you see a ton of restaurants, but you also see a ton of people, right? And so, so although it may say, you may, you know, you may think offhand, well, why would I need another restaurant on 125th Street? You know, there's a ton of people there. I just need my restaurant to be better or offer something that's not being offered. I see another question here, Derek, that um, is, is kind of off the beaten path, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, big time CEO says, how to raise capital for a project and what to offer people in return. So it's not necessarily on topic, but it's still a good question. Yeah, I think, um, and this is a, a, a place in the business world where, um, uh, you know, I've spent a lot, a lot of time. Uh, I know, I don't know if we still have Joe Paul on, but I know he's, he's the, he's the banker, banking expert. Uh, but yeah, so here's the thing. It, it's, there are a couple of ways to go, right? The first, first way to go, like I, you know, we had someone ask a couple of weeks ago about grant money. Like if somebody's going to give you money and they don't want it back, that's a great thing, right? That's a gift. That's not really how the business world generally works, but that's a great thing. The second way to think about the next money you bring in is you have to size up whether it makes sense to be debt or equity. So equity is essentially giving up a portion of your business over maybe a lifetime Maybe it's over some defined amount of time, depending on the deal you strike, but you're giving up a portion of your business. So a lot of like, you know, startup entrepreneurs, uh, you know, for me, I would say run down all of the debt options first before I would start thinking about equity. Just, and you may, you may go through all the debt options and there's none available, but I would run down them first because you really like, if you got a great idea and you really, Believe in it. You don't want to. You don't want to give up equity. You know that that easily. 
Um, so then what do you have to think about on, on the debt side? So, so a lot of businesses, they need money because uh, they're buying inventory in advance. Uh, and it's just the cycles of the business. It's like, I got a lot of great sales, but I got to stay stocked up on inventory so I never have money because I'm stocking up on inventory, but then I'm selling. And in fact, the business world even punishes you for growing faster because the faster you grow, the more inventory you got to buy and your cash flow needs are even higher. So that's a classic, that, that problem is a classic debt solution. Right. Because if you have sales uh, and you have great sales and your sales are growing and you're really just stockpiling inventory, you also should have some collateral, which are your accounts receivable and your inventory to borrow against. So, you know, that that's a kind of a classic debt solution. Um, there are other types of debt solutions. These could be like just friends and family debt solution. So I need $500,000. I'm going to find, you know, uh, you know, 50 people to give me a thousand, uh, give me $10,000 or something, or I'm going to find, you know, uh, let's, let's say I need $50,000. So I'm going to find 50 people to give me a thousand dollars and I'm going to offer to pay it back with interest and with some upside. And that is really, you know, it may not be collateralized, uh, it may, uh, you know, it, it's really a very risky loan for someone. So you're probably going to have to pay them a great return. So if it would, you know, if you're, if you're talking to, uh, to someone, you know, who's not just doing it as a favor, you're probably gonna have to pay 8% return, 10% return, maybe 50% return say like, look, I'm, I believe in this so much, give me a thousand dollars and then five years, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you 2000, but it's going to be debt and not, and not equity because I don't want to give up a piece of my, the future of my business forever. I'll, I'm willing to commit to giving you that money back in five years or two years or whenever, but I don't want to give up my business, a piece of my business forever. So I'll stop there. Hopefully somewhere in there you got an answer that helps. Yeah, let me see who else has any comments here. Derek. Uh, Joe Paul says, and this seems like more of a statement, Joe Paul says you can collateralize, collateralize, I think I said that right, equipment also if it's not fully depreciated. Yes. Equipment, maybe even trademarks, a little, little trickier. Uh, yeah, if you have physical assets, you can, you can, you can, you can uh, borrow against them, um, and uh, yeah, so that's a good way to go. So if you, you know, like we 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 uh, hearing a lot about trucking companies, which by the way, that was my 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 family business, my father's business, so I know a lot about it. But if you're buying two, three trucks. You can probably finance those, uh, and um, and you know ha have uh, have capital that you can use versus it being tied up uh, in in acquiring a truck, you know, paying up front for a truck. Got you. So let me just make sure to sum this up. You're saying, look, guys, you know, we understand companies need capital to grow to scale. Let equity, giving up equity in your company be your last option. You should really go the debt route if you can. Even if you have to pay back a higher percentage than you may want to, but in the grand scheme of your company, it's short term. Yeah. But equity is probably going to be something for the life of the company. It is. And the only... I would say that as a general convention, there are times, though, um, I just want to be clear, you know, for a certain size business, that would be what I would say very clearly. There are times when you need so much money, right, and you have such a great idea that uh, you have something that you know is, 
is, you know, something maybe you have a patent on or you have something that nobody else has um, where you may say, I'm willing, I could give up 50% of this. I need like, let's just say, I need $250 million. But, you know, what I have has got tremendous value. I'm pretty certain that this is going to be worth a billion dollars, right? So, I, you know, but I don't have the $250 million, so I'm, I'm happy to take uh, 50% of a billion um, versus not getting it done. Uh, so I'm, I'm just throwing that out there to say there's no one answer, but I would say you have to run through your options on the debt side first because as easy as it may sound, to give away part of your company, that's a lifetime decision. Unless you gotcha. have buyback options and things of that sort, you know, that is most oftentimes that's a lifetime decision. Anybody got else got any further questions for Derek Ferguson? If so, hit us in the chat really quick. And if not, I will see if anybody else wants to jump into this conversation. We're coming up on the hour. I like to try to keep it to an hour. Um, so does anybody else have any further questions for Derek in terms of determining how large the marketplace is for your particular business? Okay, uh, Derek. DJ whatever and shout to whatever who is an amazing supporter of everything we're doing here. He is definitely a mover. Um, he says great information. He was like, this was great information. So it definitely shouts to my man, whatever. Yeah. Do Deep I, Berg, I appreciate you. Ever. Do I know? Oh, I, I, I'll, I'll have to check out his Instagram. I think, I think I know, I think I know who that is. Yeah. Um, and, and, and whatever, I'm not sure if you are following um, Derek, but if not, Please go hit the icon above, tap it, and he'll come up as Vibranium Gold. Follow him, and I know Derek will follow you right back as soon as um he gets back to 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 being able to use his IG once he's done with the live. Okay, D Ferg, I'm gonna take more questions. Um, but I thank you and I appreciate you, and I'll hit you offline, brother. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Shout to my boy, Derek Ferguson. Great, great, great information as always. Great information as always. If anybody wants to jump into the side, if you have a separate um, question related to business, now is the time to ask. Uh, again, I want to um, I want to plug what you call. Matter of fact, I see sleepers for sucking. My man, David Shands. Just jumped in this live. Yo, Dave, jump, jump, hit that request button. This, this is a guy who is doing amazing things. I think so many people can learn from him. If you're not following him, please go follow um, David Shan, Sleepers for Suckers. Um, but, you, guys, this, this panel series we're doing, I really want to make sure month over month you guys are jumping on, you're spreading the word about it. We had an incredible, incredible turnout today. And I just think so many people were able to benefit from it. So, you know, shout to all my movers in the community. I appreciate y'all. Definitely shout to what y'all are doing and spread that word. Let me see if anybody's trying to jump in before we close out. Joe Paul, I see you sent the request. I see. Let me see. Not sure if you're still on the line, but if so, we get you in before we close this out. Check out that Ray Daniels interview, y'all. Joe Paul, what up, family? What are we doing, Power Moves Press? What's the word, brother? Well, two things. One, uh, I wanted to say that uh, the conversation... Oh, let me, uh, let me adjust this real fast. I feel like my head is gigantic. Um, I wanted to say, uh, when you were talking about your mother the, the, last, um, the last time that you were on live, it really touched me because I'm going through the same exact thing with my father, so... It oh, led, wow. Yeah, it led me to want um, to educate the, the movers community. Establishing common ground amongst anyone that you're doing business with is very, very key. You're going to have to break the ice at some point if you're looking for an investor, a business partner, uh, an advocate, an asset. So you want to uh, basically 
do your research beforehand and you want to establish some common ground with whoever you're going to do business with. But I wanted to say, you know, when you were talking about your mother, it really hit home to me because it's something I'm going through right now. And I wish your mother all the praise and salute. And I hope that everything works out good uh, with that situation. And please keep us posted because all us movers want the best with you and your family. The same as you. I, Joe Paul, I had no idea that um, you were going through the same thing with your father. We got to talk offline about that, but I will absolutely keep your pops in prayer. I don't know if you want to share his name. I know that there are definitely people in this community. Um, well, you know well, how people, our community people always, is. people always think that I'm rich, but my father is rich. And I don't mean rich <laughs> in money. I mean, that's his name. That, so, so that that's that's the big rich right there. He uh he was just getting he just had uh, open heart surgery um two months ago. He had a major back surgery before COVID started, where he had like eighty seven staples in his back in, in his back, and now he has a he has a hematoma and he has a a growth on his shoulder from not being able to really adjust himself because when you have open heart surgery you can only lay on your back so the blood kind of pools like in your ass and in your the back of your shoulders so so we we're, we're going through it right now but um to my to, so everyone just keep him in your prayers and I appreciate it what I wanted to say to the business community and why, why I wanted to jump on is when you're thinking about your business and you're thinking about, is it scalable? Is this something that, uh, that people are going to buy into? I want you to keep this thought in your head. What is the barrier of entry to get into this business? How unique is this business? Is this something that I can offer to people that they've never seen before? So the way Derek was saying, know what your competition is and know what your market is. Be realistic with it. Don't just come in and think, oh, I'm going to take over the world because I'm Joe Paul and I'm the greatest and I'm so cute and I got a bald head, so they're going to buy my shit. No, they're not going to. What do you have that's so unique to that industry that you're bringing value to it? So what's the barrier of entry that anyone could get into in order to get into that business? Do you need schooling? Do you need an education? Do you need know-how? Do you need partners? Do you need business uh, 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 assets in order to sustain yourself in that growing market? So I just wanted to, because um, we were talking about business planning and how to really go about this. So well, whether you're looking for a bank, you're looking for an investor, or you're just looking for capital, period, those people that you're going to be talking to are going to want to know What's so unique about you? What's so special about you? Why should I, uh, for lack of better words, why should I fuck with you? What, what is different about you that I can't get from any other person? So that's kind of one thing I just wanted to add, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, because you're always looking to grow your business. So you want to think, okay, well, how many people can get into this business just because I have the money to do so? So like, let's take, let's take two specific fields. Let's take retail, f retail food. Okay. What do you need in order to open up a deli? Do you need an education to open up a deli? Do you need schooling to open up a deli? Do you need a license to open up a deli besides like cigarette license and just the, the license to, to practice business? No, you don't. You just need the money and the capital to, to sustain yourself in that business. Doctor or a lawyer, years of schooling, various tests uh, um, in order to get their certification. So when you think about the business that you want to get into, think about how many people can get into this business if they have the money to do so. So that's just some things that you want to consider because those are all sort of things that investors and the bank are going to look at when deciding if they should fund you. And we should talk on uh, on a different different night because I know we're we're coming on the hour on the the methods of gaining capital and what's worth it and what's not. So there's the traditional funding from the bank, credit cards, line of credit, uh, installment loans, or an equipment lease. Then you have your friends and family, and and you know I, I call it the, the the crowdfunding approach. Okay, am I going to have a bunch of people that want to invest in my business? And also, if you're already in business, should I go the cash advance route 
And I don't mean cash advance on the credit card. I mean the cash advance against merchant, merchant service receivables because that's another option as well. And we should talk about that because some people might think it's shady, but at the same time, it gives you the capital that you need and it doesn't tie up your percentage of your business in perpetuity that you might have to if you got that same investment from an investor or a hedge fund or a venture capitalist. So I'd like to leave you with a little quote we are all just here for a small cup of coffee. I'm trying to drink it while it's still hot. <laughs> Always appreciate your wisdom, Joe Paul. You just, uh, you know, I, I, I think that this is going to be another night where, where we are going to have a deep dive discussion into that, the barriers of entry, uh, because I think it's, it's, it's critically important when setting out on a business, you know, Again, and it kind of ties into what Derek was just talking about in terms of the size of the market, but how easy is it to get into the market that, you know, for instance, right now, podcasts, uh, you know, once upon a time, this was a very small market. Exactly. Now it's just way too easy to get into the market. If it's you have $140, you could pay for a year subscription to Zoom. And there you go. There's and your there you go. right there. You know? So but that's a who real you, who you have, right. You have something that the world wants to see. Like, let's take your podcast, for example, which I've seen almost all of them. And uh, if you guys have a chance to check out the episode he did with Ray Daniels, it was freaking awesome. It's crazy. Ray killed it. Uh, I mean, so even going back to the one you did with, with Dame Dash, it's like you have something tangible and sustainable because of the relationships and the tenure of, you know, of your life, basically of what you've done. So you have, so you have something to add in, uh, which is called value to the world because you have these personal relationships with all these celebrities. You've helped them grow in their business, whether it's directly or indirectly. So you have a very unique a situation where the barrier of entry to get into your position is extremely high because not everyone could work with P. Diddy. Not everyone could work with Bad Boy. Not everyone could be friends with Dame Dash, Derek Ferguson, you know, Fat Man Scoop, and everybody else that, 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 you've, uh, that you've interviewed. So barrier of entry is very, very important in knowing exactly what kind of value can you bring to the equation. That's pretty much it. <laughs> We're definitely gonna have you back because I wanna um I wanna really take a deeper dive into this. I think it's something that people don't think about enough. Um when setting out on their business, they just laser focused on the fact that, you know, this is something that I can do. But sometimes you gotta ask yourself, is it something you should do? Right. Um is 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 it just too easy to get into this marketplace? And I find it now um you know we have so many people who follow me in particular because um because of my history in the music industry and again it's the same thing once upon a time you know when i was coming up in the game it, it was thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to get to a studio um so you had to want it it, it wasn't like what it is today where you can buy uh, 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 desktop uh, and go into a bathroom and make a record. And even once you made the record, if you had those thousands of dollars to make the record, then you had to go and, you know, press it up. You know, yep. you had to spend, you know, dozens, thousands, thousands, thousands of dollars. Of tens of thousands the, the, of the dollars. more money you spend on printing those, uh, like, uh, whether it's vinyl or now, I think you're freezing up. Are we here? My back? You're back. Okay. Yeah. If it if we're talking about how much money it takes to press up like vinyl or CDs or merchandise, that's the same thing that with any retail uh, business that requires you to purchase inventory. That's your tangible assets right there. So the money that you have, you know, you're probably going to be cash poor. There's, there is a thing, you know, the reason why the statement is starving artists. Okay, because we used to have to spend all our money on CDs, studio time, you know, recordings, everything of that nature in order to but sell it. I don't think people realize, and again, this is because we're definitely coming up on this hour, but I want to get this point out because maybe we'll talk about this next week, um, Joe Paul, and we'll make this the topic for the evening. But again, it's the barrier of entry 
how big is the marketplace, right? By the time that you even had a tangible product in your hand, which was CDs or vinyl back in those days, you were in the hole for close to 30 grand or so. You know, even more. Then, even more. And then what do I do with them? Now I have a thousand pieces of vinyl in my crib. What the F do I do with these now? How do I get them out? I got to go in the streets. I got to hit every DJ. I got to go to the, at that tour, at that time it was um, uh, record stores. Right. H&M and San On consignment. So everybody was, and my point I'm just trying to make, guys, everybody could not get in the game because you had to be committed to it to get in. Now, anybody can make a record because it's so easy and it has made the pool you know, you are literally a raindrop in the Pacific Ocean. So these are things you have to think about before setting it. out on business. I love that. A raindrop in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You're one insignificant little drop of water in a gigantic body of competition. That's fucking awesome. No, you should, but, that, that but, that is but that's that's literally why today, if you want to stand out, you got to go troll, dye your hair 10 different colors, Fuck. tattoo your face. I don't have any hair. You know, join join a gang. Like, this is why people are doing these things. It's not true to themselves, but I am just a drop in the Pacific Ocean, so how am I going to stand out? What can I do to make people notice me? And that's why you see it's not even about the art form anymore. It's about the marketing. It's about how can I differentiate myself. But we'll end it there, Joe Paul. It's well always said. a pleasure. Love you, my brother. You stay strong. And please, prayers for moms. Give them my best. And I will speak to you soon. One love we'll for my movies. Friends, Joe Paul. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate you. Be good. Okay, movers. Um, we're going to end it here. Please check out that Ray Daniels interview. If you have not checked it out yet, it is on iTunes, Spotify, and every other streaming um, platform out there. Shout to the guru himself, Derek Ferguson. Thanks so much for breaking down how to, uh, in its simplest form, how to determine how large the marketplace is for your product or your service. Thanks to my man, Joe Paul, for really opening up another can of worms for us to dive into at another time is really discussing the barrier entry, uh, how big the marketplace is, just depending on how easy it is to get into the market. So we'll tackle that at a different time. Shout to my man, Eddie Lopez, Reg Hunt, and so many others that I see here. Please shout, um, please pray for my boy, Joe Paul's dad, named Rich. Um, he went through open heart surgery, back surgery, so please pray for him, guys. Let's keep him in our prayers as the mover community. Soji, what up, Playboy? And I'll see you all next Monday for Motivation Monday. Peace and love, guys. See y'all later. One.